Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin, and welcome back to version three of our online meetup for Digital Rebar. How's everybody doing out there? Woo. All right, that was that was exciting. That was a <laughs> tremendous enthusiasm. I'm impressed. <laughs> so today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, BRP32 feature planning, um, planning, and where we're at with some of the previously scheduled uh, to-do items. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, feature tags and how they integrate with the endpoint and the UX. Uh, Greg from uh, Rackin is gonna demonstrate uh, VirtualBox integration with the Rebar product, and then we'll open up for some community feedback. Uh, first though, uh, let's talk a little bit about last week. Uh, last week, or actually it was two weeks ago, I guess, last uh, uh, event was uh, two weeks ago on, what was it? The 14th of, I have no idea what day today is. So the 10th of October, there we go, 14 days ago. <laughs> uh, we talked a little bit about uh, version 3.2 planning. We kicked off uh, use of the uh, GitHub issues and project tracking, which we talked about in the first uh, meetup in terms of how we wanted to track and uh, manage progressing forward with features. And uh, we had a demo, uh, a couple good demos. Um, Today, we're gonna to continue in the demo theme. Uh, it seems to be pretty positively received. Uh, in the meantime, let's uh, kick it over to uh, Greg. Uh, Greg, are you ready to do uh, VirtualBox? Yes. All right, so again, uh, Greg Greg from Rackin will show us integration with VirtualBox and digital rebar. Greg, all yours. I'll move this closer to you so you the next All right, so are we hearing me okay? Yes, indeed. Okay, so what I've got set up is a digital rebar provision uh, running on my Mac. And I've already got it kind of loaded up. And I've got my virtual box configured. Um, I kind of talked about this in the past. And I was just going to show some of the basic workflows with or with and without the virtual box content. Right? This is more meant to talk about virtual box content than the other. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete my machine and kind of start over from scratch. In this case, um, my workflow I've created is just very, very simple. I have my discover stage set as my default stage, and I'll show you that in just a minute. And then I have the ability to install two OSs, basically CentOS and Ubuntu, and then they'll just go to complete wait when they're done so that we know they're done. Um, and we're not going to wait for them to finish because they take forever. But, um, and then I have as part of my initial setup is Discover and Discovery are my two kind of sets of boot ends and stages that I'm starting with. And the idea there is I'm going to just reboot my um, VirtualBox instance and it'll pixie boot, go through the normal process. And how this normally works is the stage will be passed, it'll set the boot environment to Sledgehammer. Sledgehammer will then go up, discover the machine, run through our default stage of discover. And if I go look at that in the UI here, I can see it's got a couple of set of tasks. One is our go high to do inventory. And then it's going to make sure SSH keys, if they were configured or put in place. And then it's going to ask the system to change. The state. Um, that's kind of the default discover path. Um, and I can see it's running over here, pulling in stuff. Um, but if I go look, I can see my machine's done. It's gone through the discover stage. There's my inventory, but I don't have any other of my parameters set. Notice I don't have any action icons up here. So it's just the machine is there, but DRP can't do any out-of-band management of the system, right? So if I wanted to install an OS, I would have to go to the bulk actions icon or do some bulk actions, or I could do it through the editor. In this case, I'll go through the bulk actions and I change the stage, change it to CentOS, and force that to happen or change that to happen. But notice nothing happens. And if I reboot, then the machine will actually go and start installing CentOS. So, that, so that's a, a good demonstration of sort of the manual workflow without the 
virtual box add-ons. Correct. Um, yeah. Assuming I get it all set up. Oh, right. And I did this backwards. Um, I forgot to do something in the right order. I need to pause the machine, then I can force the machine into a state, and then we can do. But that's nothing. But anyway, so that that's the basic workflow. I paused it so that it wouldn't run the stage too soon. Um, so you can see it's now installing the CentOS environment, and we can go through that process. But I can also set up, and if I include the virtual box, in this case, I've included most of the um, content, but I included the virtual box content and the Terraform content. And then I've also included the virtual box IPMI. And then if I go and configure the IPMI plugin for virtual box, I had to give it the username that I'm running under because DRP runs as root, but needs to know who to run as so that it can then actually contact VirtualBox directly. With all this in place and configured, I can now start having DRP drive the workflow. To do that, I have to put a parameter on the node. I have to put the VirtualBox ID. To make that simpler, we've added a stage. So if I go into my workflow, I can say, okay, I wanna actually chain these stages together. So I wanna go from discover to VirtualBox discover. And then upon success of that, I want VirtualBox to go to Terraform, because Terraform is a nice holding place that I can then drive some of the other stuff from. Then I commit that. I can then go to my machine. In this case, I'll just delete it again. And this time I'll just reboot it, let it go through its process. So what I've done now is I've added into my workflow the VirtualBox Discover stage. That stage, has a single tab, or well, two tabs, I'm gonna change stage, and the other is the virtual box discover UEID. Turns out VirtualBox injects the UEID into the node as part of its attributes um, for its IPMI, DMI decode fake thing that it builds. So we can figure out what the VirtualBox UEID is. We'll set that as a parameter on the box. And in this case, since I ran Terraform ready as my final stage, it'll sit there in Terraform ready. So if I go look, the machine's already there. If I go look, I can go see at the bottom, my other two stages did their job. VirtualBox added its ID, and Terraform set itself up ready to be managed but not allocated. But you also notice I now have some icons up here, which let me take actions, the IPMI action. So in this case, the VirtualBox IPMI plugin is providing the IPMI-like actions that we would do for bare metal hardware with the IPMI plugin, but in this case, we're doing it for the virtual box nodes. So at this point, I could say, okay, well, I'm actually gonna play with Terraform. So I can use my Terraform setup that I have. Again, I think we kind of showed this last week or two weeks ago at one point, or as a video, something like that. In this case, I'm just gonna have Terraform take and find a node, one node, and install CentOS on it. So if I do Terraform apply, right, it goes and grabs the node. But if I look, it's driving the reboot sequences now and allowing the system to drive it that way. So we've now taken the virtual box environment and let you drive it as if it were an IPMIable system. So and presumably, of, Greg, that's doing that through the virtual box APIs. It's not an actual IPMI protocol. Correct. So the plugin translates that IPMI based request and turns it into a virtual box call for that, that machine. It's similar to the packet IPMI plugin as well. It does the same thing. It takes those IPMI like requests and then funnels them into the actual pick, packet API to drive reboots and resets and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of the quick virtual box integration kind of thing. The rest and of it so, is And so also you uh, demonstrated the integration also with Terraform and the Terraform ready and, and holding sort of pattern, um, but that's not necessarily required as part of the virtual box integration, right? You just gave us a bonus two for one demo there. Kind of. The reason I chose the Terraform one is because it's an active uh, use of the IPMI pieces. 
So the Terraform provider looks for the IPMI actions being available on the node. And when it sees them, it then uses those to transition the nodes through the stages. So it, it happens to be a quick way to go about it. I could also, right, I could say, okay, well, I don't really want this to finish. So I can say pause it so it doesn't go anywhere, reset the stages to, well, in this case, I could just say discover. Because it's got tasks to run, I have to force it to discover. And then I can say power cycle. And at this point, the node will happily reboot itself. And now I'm putting it back into its discovery stage. Eventually, Terraform will freak out, but that's fine. Uh, simply because we didn't drive that process through Terraform and now its state is out of sync. Yeah, so it's yeah. sitting there waiting for the node to become complete. If it does, it, Terraform will wake up, but until then, it'll just sit there and spin or 10 minutes elapse. So um, the point is the um, virtual box provider, in this IPMI provider, enables those IPMI-like actions on the virtual box. Any questions? And the silence was thunderous. <laughs> that, uh, was great. that was great. I mean, this is more for uh, like a kind of a demo situation, right? No, not really. It's, it allows you to actually do uh, dev test work in VirtualBox as an environment as opposed to uh, packet.net or bare metal. So it allows you to more easily test um, within your laptop as a confined resource running VirtualBox. While still maintaining the basic bare metal driving capabilities with your IP. Exactly. Equivalent, equivalent functionality for uh, ma machine control actions that you would drive through a different. Right, right, right. So you can bare metal environment. So okay. Cat on the on chat asked which uh, network is my demo running on. In this case, I have a VirtualBox network set up. So if I come over to my machine, um, that's, that's a great great question, Chris. <laughs> and so I have a VirtualBox network. Um, I added it. I turned off the DHCP server, and then in the UI in the UI, I configure my VirtualBox settings with it, um, with the IP address, and then basically take over. Um, the main thing to be aware of with VirtualBox is that you need to make sure you've at least started the virtual machine and stopped it before you start DRP, because the VirtualBox interface, at least on Macs, won't show up until you actually start a virtual uh, machine on that network. So I've done this enough on my system that it was present. Um, the other thing is that's a uh, gotcha on Max at least is that you have to make sure you add this special route for broadcast because BSD kernels rock and they don't have default broadcast actions. So you have to say what interface you want the broadcast replies to go out. And so in this case, I tell it to use my virtual box network. And so there is a little bit of setup that we have to, to do in addition because of the vagaries of VirtualBox and Mac integration if you're on a Mac. Yeah. So basically, and, and I put the host only network and turned off my DHCP server. So. And Kat, your question was related to the DHCP server integrated into VirtualBox, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would be content to use the virtual box DHCP server if um, it had the ability to specify what the next file it should boot from is, but it doesn't have that as an easy, easy specifiable parameter. So uh, what it is. So we, we already have a DHCP server. We just take over and use it. There we go. Okay, excellent. Any any other questions for Greg before we uh, move forward? No? Okay, excellent, Greg. Really appreciate that. It's really cool integration, and I think it'll help a lot of people that are trying to do uh, dev test work 
um, with VirtualBox as their environment to drive and test some of the workflow pieces and uh, help with that automation of, of test framework uh, in a more constrained environment. There, there, there is a question we sometimes get asked that I would, I would tack on. I know you're trying to wrap up this section. Fire away, Rob. Uh, people, we, we chose to do VirtualBox first because uh, it's just a developer story for somebody with a Mac um, who's using VirtualBox to make this happen. Um, but it's, it would be possible to do a similar thing with KVM. Um, and presumably any of the other uh, uh, VMware Fusion or any of those actions, uh, any of those other sort of machine virtualization solutions can be integrated with content or plugin capabilities. So for, so for local, but local, local virtualization hosts, not for yes, virtualization. exactly. Yeah, just, just as a, we get, we get okay. asked that on a regular basis. Okay, excellent. Uh, next up on the agenda item is to talk a little bit about feature tags. We're going to do a little bit of a discussion panel with some of the Racken engineers. Um, feature tags are an interesting new thing we're adding. Uh, it's um, well, actually, let's kick it over. Uh, Rob, why don't you explain a little bit about sort of the the issue we're trying to tackle with this first? From a feature tags perspective. Exactly. Um, what what does feature tags bring us as a, a capability that we're trying to tackle? So the, one of the challenges that, that we're seeing, and this has been a topic in the community quite a bit, so it's very timely, is that there are three major components um, to using, there's really four major components to using digital rebar. Um, one is the endpoint itself and the API of the endpoint and its capabilities. So it's the major version number of that. Another one is the content that is run by that endpoint. So that content would be packages um, of, of other objects, so the, the content upload packages or the plugins. Um, both of, all of those components, and there can be a lot of them, have their own versioning pieces and they have some version dependencies within themselves and then with other uh, content within the system. So um, if you write a stage, the stage is going to be dependent on a boot M and tasks and templates and things like that. So there's, there's sort of this interconnected web of composable units, which is how we design things, but that creates a, does this work with that type of question? And then the user interface, um, while we try to keep the API very stable, uh, relies on the API. And so if the API changes or we fix a bug uh, that we were working around in the API, um, it can cause um, behavioral differences where the UI right now, the UI doesn't take into account uh, multiple versions of an endpoint or, or feature differences between the endpoints. So all of those places where there's version differences between one piece and another piece are uh, flaggable, if you will, to make sure the systems can either tell you that they won't work or even better, um, adapt to whether or not a capability is there depending on whether flags are triggered. High level inter introduction of what the concept is. Okay, and Greg, so can you talk a little bit uh, about um, exactly what are the feature tags uh, within uh, the DRP endpoint side? So <laughs> feature tags will be used to indicate a function is present or not, I guess, but mostly if a function, a feature is present, we're maintaining those as lists at various points in the product. Um, an idea is like we'll have um, like API v3, I think is one of the current feature tags and then just added one for sane exacodes is another one, for example, where we have versions and the versions we could keep a big table of versions that match things, but instead we've kind of chosen, we'd rather look for features that are present. That way we don't have to necessarily always keep updating these tables. So we've tried to provide these feature tags at various levels and the DRP uh, daemon has a list. The content bundles have the ability to specify that they have feature tags as well. And um, I kind of like Victor talked about what we, uh, how we chose to implement it. Yeah. 
So the reason we came up with, uh, or the reason that uh, we came up with feature tags to begin with is that in the original, in the original set of Rackham content, we had uh, four ways to exit out of any given script. One, one exit code sig to signal success, which is zero. One exit code, which uh, signals that we need to reboot, but it was otherwise successful, which was uh, exit code one. Uh, another exit code that signaled that uh, the task was not finished running, but that it didn't fail. And a third code to indicate that it wasn't finished running, it didn't fail, but we still need to reboot the system anyways. Um, so where we ran into the issue there is that uh, everyone in their dog who writes Unix scripts tends to just write exit one to mean uh, I failed uh, as a generic failure code without even really thinking about it. And so I went ahead and devised a scheme so that uh, we stored any special meaning for exit codes in the high bits of the exit code. Um, right now we have, uh, we have uh, incomplete running, we need to reboot, we need to shut down, and we need to stop the runner as our exit codes. And the low bits are left over for whatever the script decides to implement so that a naive exit one uh, works. Um, however, without uh, some way of letting the content tell the runner, here's what my exit code should be, um, there wasn't an easy way to disambiguate between whether or not they were using the uh, old exit codes or the new ones, because exit one is uh, depressingly common. Uh, both directly and indirectly. So I went ahead and uh, plumbed up feature flags so that uh, they can be specified by uh, DR provision itself, in which case that's a, a kind of a system-wide feature that the system supports. Uh, right now there are two feature tags for that, one that indicates we're on API version three, and there's a, another one that I just added. Which one did I just add? Um, oh yes. Uh, indicating that uh, the UX should render how we return uh, statistical information about blobs. Um, and then there's another feature code, which is the same exit codes, which uh, is, uh, is sort of indicates a contract between content and the uh, task runner to say, to, to indicate uh, what the exit code from any given uh, task should, uh, should mean to the runner. And the, the interesting thing about this is in some cases we could have relied directly on version, but the, one of the issues is that not all the levels have direct access to those versions. And so things like the content bundles, which while they have their own DRP shouldn't have to keep track of what version a, a, a bundle is. So the feature code, the feature flags effectively, allow us to, or tags in this case, um, allow us to push into, um, with the content, what its state is. So, um, for example, if you look at the tip content, you'll start seeing things like tasks indicating that they use sane exit codes. That way, the runner, if you're on tip, knows how to process both. But because we have feature tags both at the DRP side and the content side, we can make bi-directional decisions. So for example, the content uh, change stage script knows how to check DRP to see if it supports same exit codes or not, and then be able to drive whether or not it returns a one, a four, or whatever the appropriate exit code is based upon what the DRP can support. So the, the idea was to provide both the direction for the content as well as the, the DRP. Now, while we use it today in the content layers, this is also available for the UI to make decisions on as well. So going forward, like Victor mentioned, he's added one where we massaged how we report stats on blobs. So the thought that allows the UI to look and see, okay, this DRP is going to send me stats in a certain way, so then it can make the decision and work in both pre-updated and then updated environments. Okay. So the goal there would be to have the UX support um, uh, a DRP endpoint that might not have specific capabilities. The UI would sort of devolve to that older behavior, that older support to be able to enable it uh, to function 
uh, without breaking in the presence of older DRP features versus newer DRP features. Is that correct? Yeah, that is yeah. exactly it. Sweet. Uh, Rob, did you have any last uh, bits you wanted to add to that before we wrap up panel discussion and move on? No, that's good. Thank you for checking. Okay, excellent. It's really interesting. Uh, looking forward to seeing that get uh, implemented a little bit more, uh, getting the UX smoothed out or around uh, some of the uh, capabilities and reacting appropriately to the different DRP uh, endpoints out there. Uh, definitely something that uh, we're aware of as an issue that needs to be shored up, working hard on that. I'm looking forward to that um, being implemented a little bit more uh, going forward. Uh, next, we wanted to talk a little bit about community feedback. Um, just open up the uh, floor for community members on board to ask any questions. We had some uh, requests from, and I apologize, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that because I know I'll get it wrong, uh, from K. Stanislav on our uh, Pound community channel asked about the type of supportive images and necessity of building an image on a customer CI/CD workflow. Uh, that's one of the questions we have. Uh, we had some questions recently on Pound community uh, around rack and portal templates, parameters, et cetera. So um, uh, we have anyone that wants to uh, bravely step forward and go first there. Okay. No, I will volunteer Will. You've had some uh, questions uh, around. <laughs> I wasn't going to go. You don't volunteer, you're going to get volunteered, my friend. Uh, yeah. So uh, you had some questions around uh, parameters and profiles, I believe, uh, a week ago. Uh, have those been resolved? Have you gotten those sorted out and got a handle on no. those? I mean, I, so I've been trying to use the beautiful UI and getting bloodied in the process. And uh, um, so I think from what I just heard is the feature flag should take care of some of that. I don't know if I, don't know if I get that until we go to 3.2. Yeah, right? so one of the that challenges that you're facing is the fact that the feature flag flags won't show up until uh, you move to tip or, the, or we get a new stable out there. Right. Um, on top of that, I think one of the issues that Stable had is that there was a bug, in, or still is a bug in Stable, with regard to dealing with parameters that have slashes in their names, which, as you can see, uh, well, you can't see, but it's a uh, the the stage map one, right? Well, there's lots oh, of the other slashes. Yeah. Now, okay. Yeah. It just happens. It's any of them of which. The one that you're trying to deal with, which is the change stage map, does and causes the workflow editor not to necessarily work correctly because it's trying to save something with a slash. Right. That's the, so that's resolved in tip and is addressed. The challenge is while tip is seemingly functional, I mean, I haven't seen any problems with it. I, I um, disagree. <laughs> Well, as far as the UX goes, so yeah, I have sorry, to... tip of uh, DRP. Yeah, um, DRP. it seems to be fine. There's issues with the UX for sure. The we haven't necessarily prepared to to spin out a new um, stable yet, and my my hope is that we will do that sooner than later to, to fix the parameter bug. Because in actuality, it's not just this workflow parameter that's the problem. It's any parameter you try and save anywhere on profiles, machines, any of those will have the problem. So um, it's just, that's what it is. So you yep. need to cut that, cut a release here shortly for that. Um, and that's coming. But that, that'd be cool. I think that's one of the bigger issues that you're hitting with regard to like, driving workflows and driving that is that if you have a stable and you're using the UX, then being able to set certain sets of parameters won't work correctly. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. In, I, I, so it's I TLI has the same problem. Oh, okay. In, in relation to that, Will, that's sort of the, um, we're trying to, to get the UX, you know, fully released. And right now it's being developed against TIP, like Greg is saying. And so that's definitely caused some friction for you. 
uh, with what you're trying to do between UX and your DRP endpoint being unstable, which is the right thing to do for a production platform. Um, right. For sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm still in like, I, I guess I'd call it test acceptance, but I'm actually using it to do my work, you know, so it's production for me. It's not, I'm, I'm going to try to pitch it on a company level, you know, but like in the meantime, I've gotten rid of Cobbler and went to digital rebar provision and it stopped working. So I, in the meantime, I have to do work. <laughs> so that's my problem. And, and I understand it's like bits are in motion and all the rest of that. But it, I think if the message is, hey, this is, we're ready to replace cobbler, throw away your cobbler and use DRP, you, you have to like ensure that stable continues to work. I'm not telling anybody anything they don't already know, I'm sure. But um, it, it's like, I, I would say it's become more critical to do that. That's my opinion. I, yeah, I, and so, I, well, no, go ahead, Ron. Well, you're making a good point, and, and here's here's what we're we're trying to work through, um, because we don't we don't want to break stable. Um, that's right, clearly not our goal with, with this. Um, the there's an interesting mix of bringing in new content packs, right? This is where the feature flag pieces come in. Um, and exposing those features in the UX so that people can take advantage of new things. Um, and, and then um, dealing with back, back to stable. Because right, one of the simple answers for us would have been in 3.1 to just say, well, work, we don't support workflow in the 3.1 stable. You have to be in TIP, um, which, is not our, which is not what we want. And the, we're adding the feature flags to try and create some protection so that we can turn things on or off, depending on you know, which version you have and, and what features we know would work. Um, but the, the consequence might be that you get, you actually get less, um, the features that you want aren't available against 3.1 stable or an older version. And the UX simply just won't present you with those options. If you we don't have a DMP endpoint supports them. That's what feature flags would do. Right. That sounds reasonable. Okay. Um, that, I mean, that's what I need to put in a little backing logic to do that. But it's, you know, if, if, if everybody's okay with that, we'll start, you know, actually only making features available when, they're, when you have an appropriate TIP version or a stable version. It sounds sounds good. Yeah, in, in this in this case, the specific case you're talking about, um, there was a there was a behavior change that the UX had to fix um, to implement patches instead of puts because the machine machine updates and object updates were, were actually breaking um, in, in some some bad ways, and so we we have to I have to figure out how to go and, and retro the, the specific thing you're asking for for. for so it was a real fundamental architectural change, is what I'm hearing. The, it's it, I wouldn't know. It, it's not the UX. The UX switched to using patches, meaning it only changes the fields that you change. So it's actually it, it's completely invisible. The API is always, always supported yeah, in the UX. And you, yes. So. The, the tooling was already in place. The UX wasn't taking advantage of it. And so what was happening is if you were on objects, any object you touched, we replaced the full object in the UX, which was breaking things if, you, if there were partial objects. Um, and so we fixed that. And then that exposed this problem, um, which we didn't catch because we were on tip um, and hadn't, hadn't been testing some of these changes against the uh, previous version, which is another thing, a process that I'm so going forward, would it be a thing to like regression test stable? That's exactly right. We need to be testing against what stable does. All right. Yeah, just later. I mean, you only support current stable, I take it. For the UX? That's uh, in, in any of it. Like we, you, 
you know, there'll be a series of stable releases. The, you would only tend to support because you're a small team, the, the latest one and not like two back, three back, stuff like that. Correct. I think, and I think we need to define within, you know, for customers and then within community, what support means from that perspective and where the version drift would be. So part of the feature flag conversation includes how far cross versions to content does content go um, from a DRP perspective. Um, does that make sense? So if you, if you pick up a content pack that was designed to work with TIFF, our goal is that it should work with 3.1 stable. Um, but it might not, which is why we added the feature flags. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I totally see that. Well, and another way of thinking about feature flags is we all sort of understand that uh, DRP endpoint itself has a 3.0, 3.1, 3.2 version number, and it's easy to correlate features and capabilities with those version numbers. Feature flags gives us the ability to have one UX code base that supports multiple versions at once. I got a thumbs yes, up from Will, the, so I think that really does, that helps to understand. Right, the UX is not versioned. It's it's always exactly. latest. Exactly, but we have to be able to integrate and interoperate with current tip, old stable, etc. Capabilities of so the DRP endpoint. Yeah, I think I think just for stability reasons, it's important because the experience of someone you know, getting latched onto this product, putting it into their workflow, and then all of a sudden it breaks because, oh, we we developed this cool new thing, but we had to change the behavior to support it, isn't a great story. I mean, I, I know why it happened, but it, it it tends to sour people. And I'm I'm not even talking about like money paying people. It's like building the open source, you know, building the wave on this product. You You would hate to have it take hits like that. Great. And we appreciate your patience, and we're happy to have the discussion. We obviously, yep. don't want to, we don't want to hide from it. Yep. Cool. So, also, real quick, on the side here, um, I was kind of showing how you actually can edit parameters in stable right now, which is. Um, if you export them to the CLI, the whole object, so like if I wanted to edit a profile, I would do the show in a format that I like to edit and then save that. I think Shane has posted this as well. And then I can edit what I want, right? And then I can re-inject that as an update. And then that will update it. And then that's that will update. You know, should update this map. Sending the message. Oh, my timer went off. Amazing. My tokens timer off. My workflow should and, be. So, and it's also important to note that you can make changes in the UI and if that's more comfortable for you and you're not sure exactly how you would form or uh, what you need to change in the JSON or the YAML. And then you can go back to the CLI and do a dump of the uh, configuration as Greg is showing you here. You know, DRP CLI profiles, uh, in this case, it would be show global, which would dump the uh, current global configuration. You can edit it, make changes to it, and then you can re-inject re it back in. And we had an interesting conversation on uh, Pound Community, or rather it was me sort of blathering on, but the conversation was basically the use of the ability to uh, drive uh, di building an entire DRP endpoint from JSON or YAML configuration exclusively. And so it makes it very easy to drive it in a CI-CD pipeline, which um, our, we, lo we lost... Uh, uh, K. Stanislav, I, I'm not going to say his first name, I'll butcher it, 
um, we lost him on the, the feed here. Um, and he had some questions basically about CICD pipelines. And that's one of the really nice things is you can completely provision uh, a DRP provisioning endpoint uh, dynamically uh, through API and JSON YAML injection. And yeah, it's not the friendliest to look at, read, edit. Um, you know, it's a lot easier sometimes to digest things in graphical form in the UX. Um, but you can use the two in conjunction with each other in learning how to build a DRP endpoint and spin it up and, and provision your provisioner, so to speak, um, uh, very quickly. Uh, that's We're kind of running out of time here on the community feedback section. Uh, it's always good to get uh, uh, conversations going with the community, see how people are using things, what problems they're running into, so it can help us shape fixing things going forward. Um, next step we're going to jump over to uh, is to version 3.2 uh, release planning. Um, Greg, do you have our GitHub uh, issues and planning board up you can uh, bring up? And we'll take a look at our uh, Kanban, Kanban-like uh, project board and uh, DRPV ver 3.2. So some of the things that we had moved into the to-do column, uh, machine inventory, default stage transition, uh, local file server or file service and HTTP endpoint for passing JSON and YAML in, uh, embedded assets override. Um, yeah, since you're driving things, Greg, you want to go ahead and, and start either at the top or wherever, you, whatever strikes your fancy. Uh, so on the, um, which one did you open up? I missed that. Machine inventory. Uh, machine inventory. Yeah, yeah. So on the machine inventory, uh, we wanted to uh, add the ability to generate dynamic uh, machine information from and harvest uh, information off of uh, a node, a machine as it's booting during the uh, discovery stage in, in Sledgehammer. And uh, Victor has done a, a huge amount of work on uh, using what was called uh, OHI. OHI was a solution for doing a similar sort of thing. So he developed a, a quick um, put together solution uh, called GoHi, uh, which uh, provides a lot of the same features and capabilities. And we've started extending that uh, Go that OHI capabilities. Uh, Victor, you want to take a real quick minute and just talk about a little bit of the work you did around that and uh, what it's going to be able to provide for us? Sure. So right now, um, GoHi is present in the current uh, iterations of uh, Sledgehammer. So if you're running off of uh, TIP and you have the uh, most recent uh, OS discovery content, you'll have a version of uh, Sledgehammer that has uh, GoHi baked in. And uh, what it currently pulls from the box is all of the DMI info that is parsable. Um, it also pulls in, that includes you know, system information, chassis information, information about your CPUs, um, information about the memory if it's uh, present on your system. And I believe uh, Craig is going through it right now. Um, the second thing that it uh, pulls out of the system right now is information on the uh, network, on the uh, NICs that are present in the system. And uh, right now it just uh, iterates over the list of NICs that are visible to go and it uh, pulls in you know, various useful information, uh, what, their hard drive, what, their, uh, what their Ethernet address is, uh, what current flags they're running with, um, what uh, speed they're running at, what uh, modes they support, that includes things like uh, speed, whether or not obvious negotiation is turned on, and a whole ton of other stuff. Um, we can also pull in what IP addresses they have, and also some basic uh, information on the system itself. Uh, what architecture it's running, what version of the kernel it's running, how much memory is available to DOS, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's always more stuff that can be added to that, but that I thought was a good, uh, good useful starting point for, for you know, gathering some basic system inventory stuff. Um, right now, the uh, GoHi is in a closed repository, and we've uh, thought about opening it up for comments or development, but I don't think we've actually uh, taken any action on that yet. Um, other than that, you know, I'm open to community feedback as to uh, what to implement in it next. Um, I already know that uh, people want uh, some basic disk information in the system, and uh, I'm sure there are other things that are eluding me right now. So disk, disk inventory information and GPU as well. Yeah, Greg's adding that now. It was a couple, couple questions uh, around inventory uh, feedback. So ultimately, um, GoHi will go ahead. 
or a GPU inventory, if someone can give me uh, a method that is better than look for a PCI device that has the I'm the video card bit set, um, I'm all ears. <laughs> that, that is a tough one to solve. That might be a coming eventually feature before, uh, certainly after disk inventory is my guess. But um, So it looks like uh, the Go High stuff is pretty close to being ready to bake to go into 3.2 uh, when we cut 3.2 as stable. Uh, unless someone does something, uh, unless some, someone deliberately pulls it out, it's going to be in 3.2. So. All right, excellent. Uh, and last, uh, I just wanted to mention about the Go High stuff. Uh, it's very uh, fascinating because it helps uh, bring uh, digital rebar provision, the ability to provide uh, inventory information back into centralized configuration management services and databases, uh, which is also a, a strong uh, pillar stone uh, for uh, immutable infrastructure and infrastructure as code tenancies. So it's really nice to see those capabilities added in there so we can start uh, integrating with external CMS, CMDB solutions and moving uh, closer uh, to, uh, in lo tighter lockstep with infrastructure as code tenancies. Uh, Greg, go ahead on default stage transition. Yeah, so in this case, this was to, um, we were noticing a pattern in all the stages. They basically all call change stage at the end. And so, um, we are going to bake that into the runner so that it always does a change stage and can pay attention to the actions a little better in that regard. And so then stages can be a little simpler and not have to have the change stage everywhere. Um, and we started reviewing that and then um, in the process realized that we might want to review some default content and some other stuff. So. This kind of stalled for a little bit for that. Um, and we've had, we've already done one of the things, we've added the none stage, which is a initial one that DRP always has that basically does nothing. So, and sets the boot environment to local. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Along the way, we've also uh, made the, uh, the default content, which is the none stage. Um, the ignore and the local boot environments. Uh, we've moved them out of the writable store and into one that is uh, read only. Yeah. So you may see um, a new content store called Basic Store. And the Basic Store is. Ah, it does upgrade again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we got, got to fix that. But um, Basic Store is where you will find um, the default set of things, none local and um, ignore. So those are always available as options so that the system can always be set to uh, start up. Excellent. And uh, where do you think we are in relation to 3.2 uh, readiness? Um, to me, this is, this feature is the other one that we were required to move and create a 3.2. So it is a blocking feature from my perspective. Um, and so we need to make some decisions about default content and then when we make those, the rest of this will fall out um, fairly quickly. So it, it's a, I have some initial code started on it, but uh, there's more to re, retweak on it. But um, yeah, so, that's where we're at. We're currently trying to decide what stage content should be out there by default, if any, and uh, where that would live. And so part of that helps inform what this the rest of the code should look like and how it operates. OK, excellent. Uh, any community questions on stage transition? Nope, OK. Uh, local file service, file serve, <laughs> I'm tripping over that one, uh, local file store and HTTPS endpoint for passing JSON blobs. So currently uh, the mechanism to pass in JSON is uh, a dash less than foo JSON. Uh, the request was basically, could we be able to do create and then HTTP colons, whack, whack, some path to a JSON file or point to a JSON file on local file service. Um, so that's essentially that feature. 
uh, hasn't yet been assigned to anyone or cat, um, prioritized uh, would be nice to have in 3.2, but I don't think it's a blocking feature for 3.2. Not much more to, to update on that. Uh, an embedded asset override. So the problem with uh, embedded assets is since uh, DR provision itself as a binary contains a lot of sort of startup uh, embedded information in it, uh, it's exploded out into your file store. Um, the initial file store type is uh, a file service uh, backend on the DR provision endpoint. Uh, we have the ability to add plugins to store uh, uh, file store information to other plugin, uh, other store types, uh, for example, key value services. Uh, but in this case, uh, when we exploded out the embedded assets, if there are some issues or bugs or updates that are needed to it that need to be done in the field or on the fly, the next time that DR provision is started or restarted or, or receives a HUP signal, uh, it'll re-explode um, that asset out into your file store overriding your configuration. So it's kind of hard to, to patch things in the field if they need to be, or add features or capabilities in the field before they become uh, mainstream in the product line. Um, Greg, you had some thoughts on, on doing that. Um, any feedback or information on it? I don't see us, any tickets uh, updates on this yet, so I don't think yeah, we've done any work around it yet. Originally, I was just gonna have a flag that turned off overriding altogether. But I think uh, in our discussions, you convinced me that a new flag that specified a directory um, that we either override the overrides with or most likely just copy that into the locations um, will be more useful mm -hmm. and generally uh, sensible. So that's what we'll do. Um, in all honesty, this one and the previous one aren't a huge amount of work. It's just it's just scheduling time to to do them and validating them and right. Doing the tests for them. So um, okay. So so in the meantime, we'll leave these last two on the three two list. If we get to them, we'll move them forward into the three two product line. They might fall back into uh, the. Um, uh, uh, wanted want to do list and uh, they may not yet they may not make it into three two uh, let's see we're closing in on the top of the hour uh, last we wanted to uh, talk about or the backlog that's that's the word I was looking for they might fall back into the backlog column uh, and the last things we wanted to talk about was open up for any questions uh, the community has uh, any discussions uh, about what we want to see in the next meetup in two weeks. Uh, so any uh, questions, feedbacks, or, acts, or requests on uh, next meetup's agenda, open floor. Go ahead. Uh, Nothing. So nobody has no questions and no agenda items for next week. Okay. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, post uh, next week's agenda in the next few days. Look for that uh, on the uh, regular channels on the meetup.com digital rebar website, and we'll get the agenda document out. So feel free to make comments on it when that gets posted. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're going to wrap up and we're going to uh, leave you with final thoughts on wrap up. Uh, We've got a lot of uh, help and resource websites out there. Um, please check them out. Uh, the digital repar website, rebar.digital, rackend is rackend.com. Uh, also, we've got a, a growing um, set of YouTube videos along the lines of the video that uh, Greg, uh, demo that Greg gave us previously uh, in the hour uh, regarding virtual box. There's a number of other uh, digital rebar version three uh, uh, demo videos out there and available. If you have any requests in the community for specific uh, content for demo, we're always open and interested in new ideas and looking forward to providing new content to help out everybody in the community and our users with digital rebar. Uh, any other last questions or thoughts before we wrap up and uh, close down for the day? Nothing. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate your attendance, your time. Look forward to seeing you again in two weeks and on the community channel. Cheers.
Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Shane.